This is News Talk 980 CKNW. Welcome back to the Steel and Drex show. It's Jody Vance in with Tim Dickert uh, taking you through this afternoon on a Wednesday. And uh, let's talk some money, shall we? Interest rates and oil prices in particular making headlines today and changes to Canadians' household debt. So let's bring in Michael Campbell, host of Canada's top rated financial show, Money Talks, to speak about these and other issues. Hey, Mike. Hi, how are you doing? It's sounding great so far. Thank you Keep very going. much. We're having a good time. <laughs> Thanks so much. So, Mike, uh, let's start with the long-anticipated announcement by the uh, Federal Reserve. Yeah, it was interesting because th- this is the real will-they-won't-they they kind of thing because it was this time last year, uh, Tim, that we had the Federal Reserve raise interest rates. It was the first time since the subprime crisis in 2008. But what they said at the time was, hey, guess what? We're going to raise them three more times this year, which they didn't, uh, you know, in the next year, rather, in the 2016 year, uh, which they didn't. Uh, but we did get that long-anticipated hike today, you know, and they're saying, I mean, the big question, obviously, is what's going to happen after this. This one was widely anticipated. The markets have completely discounted this. But, I mean, the question becomes, uh, is there more to come? And would we believe them if they said so? So today they said yes. I think they said it was three more times in 2017, but at that point I sort of fuzzed out because who cares? <laughs> they, they told us four times in 2016. That didn't look too good. So yeah, but they are suggesting there's more rate hikes to come. Okay, so this does, does this add to the pressure for the Bank of Canada to raise rates? Well, I think they were anticipating this. So last week, Stephen Polos, head of the Bank of Canada, said no. He says, you know, our economies aren't at the same sort of place in the cycle. We still have a lot of slack in the Canadian economy there. We haven't, you know, we got some better numbers in the third quarter, but that was really a lot to do with rebuilding in, uh, you know, Fort McMurray. The oil production had lost 47 million barrels, by the way, but of course it picked up again once things sort of got at least to some semblance of normal. I mean, it's certainly not there yet, but again, uh, so they're not looking for big, robust growth here. And uh, so I'm not seeing any rate increase, because I'm just going by what the Bank of Canada told us, not any rate increase in 2017 even. And so, But the place we will feel the impact, though, is in the loonie. Uh, you know, right now we're getting the loonie boosted by, you know, the oil price rise. But I think when it settles down, again, the states is going to provide higher interest rates. It's kind of like your bank gives higher interest rates than mine. Money starts going toward you, and that'll push the U.S. dollar up and, you know, the Canadian get a little softer. Well, uh, staying on oil, then we've got we've had this jump uh, in oil because of that announcement that OPEC uh, is reducing production by 1.2 million barrels a day. Uh, where does that take us next? Well, I think you're right. First of all, the market you know reacted positively to OPEC's news, and then a few, just a couple of days ago, they react to the non-OPEC producers saying they're also going to cut production by about 600,000 barrels. I mean, we'll see if this all comes to fruition, but that's what they're saying at this point. I mean, traditionally, by the way, OPEC cheated on that kind of an announcement. I think they said, the stuff I read, the research I read said, you know, if they say they're going to cut 100 barrels, they're going to only cut 60. So mm. we'll just see how that plays out. But here's the thing with the oil market itself. I mean, you know, all the, you know, it's clearly moved on this news um, that we've got this big bump up, you know, in the 51 to 52, 53 dollar range. So I'm wondering, what's the next piece of news that's going to move this market? I mean, I don't think you're not going to hear any more on the production side of things. Uh, so what about the demand side? I'm not seeing that move. But, but so I'm not as confident. I'm not playing this further to go up. But at the same time, I've got to look at the market. The market's telling me at this point, at least short term, it wants to move higher. But, yeah, I still think that market's got a lot of problems on both sides, the demand side. And, yeah, they're going to cut supply, but let's see if the oil stands pick up that supply. Let's see if, you know, fracking in the U.S. picks up that supply. So there's still some uh, chapters left in that story. Right. So even with the uncertainty, this is all good news for Alberta's producers. Yeah, they absolutely are. I mean, they sure heck. I mean, remember, we got oil down to twenty six, twenty eight dollars a barrel. So they're doing the same stuff, the same cost, and yet they're going to get twice as much money for it, or close to that. So that's one thing. And I mean, you can do things like they can hedge their future production, like sell today, you know, at today's prices, and deliver it like three months from now or something. But the other thing is this: is keep in mind, there's been a huge, you know, yes, we acknowledge the political shift in the states, but we just got. Governor, uh, Texas, former Texas Governor Rick Perry, he's just been announced as the energy minister there. Well, he's pro oil, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump is pro oil. Mm -hmm. Uh, They've got uh, the Oklahoma Attorney General Scott Pruitt. He's going to be the head of the EPA and Environmental Protection Agency. So you got all of that mixed together, and it looks like I don't think anybody's going to be surprised if they get the go ahead for the Keystone XL pipeline. 
uh, you know, that can't be too far in the future. That'll be great for Alberta, which, uh, as I kind of mentioned to a friend of mine, so it's kind of ironic that uh, NDP Premier Notley out of Alberta is going to be a lot happier with the results of a Trump administration on this file than he certainly was for the Obama administration. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, so I think that could be really good news for what's going on, and uh, you know, for the oil producers. That's another line that's going to go down to the Gulf. So that, I, I, I'd be surprised if that the Keystone doesn't get passed now. Okay, well, let's uh, let's switch gears for a second uh, and talk about personal finance. Uh, we've got these latest stats on household debt. It shows uh, some some changes from what we've been seeing. Well, one of the things is that uh, well, it depends what we're going to look at here. You know, is the ultimate number of debt, or I think more valuable is you look at your household debt that you compare, which is by the way now about two trillion dollars in Canada when you. Uh, total it all up. But, you know, we've got to remember that it's kind of like your house went on. Yeah, you borrowed 200 grand for a mortgage, but your house tripled in price in Vancouver. So we now see our assets at $10 trillion. So we've got five bucks of assets every dollar of debt. That's pretty good. But it's not just housing that's doing it. I looked at some of the other financial numbers coming out today. So we've got $3.17 of financial assets. It might be stocks, you know, whatever, uh, you know, for every dollar of debt. So you have to look at both. If, if we're, we're going to be worried about our debt problem, obviously, what did we borrow the money to buy? And if those assets are rising faster than our debt levels, it's not as big a worry. So does that mean that the alarm bells shouldn't ring? Well, it's interesting because what I just talked about is what the media always talks about. But I just look at it this way. If we've got, let's say my house is worth a million dollars and I owe 500000 but yet I can't make the payments. That's not good news for me. It's just good news to whoever lent me the money. Right. And that's what that, that, you know, we talk about debt compared to our assets. That's really saying, hey, don't worry if you lent the money to Canadians. They're in pretty darn good shape that way if they have to sell. But that's not how I'm going to measure it. I'm going to say, oh, thank goodness, uh, one of the banks got paid back because I could sell my house and live on the street. So that's not the big measure for me. It's, you know, how's your cash flow? And that's what I think individuals should look at here. How's your cash flow? If you had a disruption to your cash flow, you know, unfortunately you lose a job or, you know, some sort of disability that prevents you from earning, how does your debt picture look then? Can you afford it? Because that's where it really hits us as individuals. So, yeah, that first set of stats is sort of the general economy. How's it going to do for the financial sector? But I, uh, you know, let's face it, as individuals, we don't go, yeah, I lost my house, but gee, I'm happy. Most Canadians didn't. So that doesn't, that's <laughs> no. not going to make you feel better. So no. I look at what the individual circumstances are. Uh, well, I got to be honest, I just pulled out my phone, checking my own finances while you were talking there. I think I'm okay, but... Uh, <laughs> You've got a bead of sweat running down yeah. your brow, though, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, Michael. Uh, I appreciate but it. Can you imagine? Yeah, when I talk, a lot of people start doing something else. So that's <laughs> fine, Tim. You're in good shape. Thanks, Mike. Okay, my pleasure. Vancouver's News, Vancouver's Talk. This is News Talk 980 CKNW.